give an intro again. This webinar is hosted by the Palestinian Youth Movement and the International League of People Struggle uh, United States Country Chapter. Uh, the International League of People Struggle is a broad alliance of over 300 um, anti-imperialist and democratic mass organizations um, represented within over 40 different countries um, looking to unite their struggles against imperialism and towards shared campaigns um, for national liberation um, and people's rights. Uh, so our ILPS US chapter uh, is very excited to be hosting, co-hosting this webinar um, with the Palestinian Youth Movement, which is a grassroots movement of Palestinian and Arab youth who are actively struggling for the liberation of their homeland and people. Um, We'll, there will be more um, calls to action about what ILPS and PYM are up to that you can join us in at the end of this webinar. Um, but before I pass it off to our speakers, I just wanted to um, go over some kind of logistical points. Uh, so everyone who's on now, please um, add your city and your organization to your name so we know who's on here. Um, and we ask that everyone stay muted for the duration of the webinar. Um, we'll also be having a Q&A session at the end, um, and so we're asking um, throughout the webinar, um, please feel free to leave comments in the chat. We also encourage you to ask your questions in the chat, um, and we'll be taking note of those questions throughout the webinar, and we'll be asking them, um, posing them to our speakers at the end. Um, so that's kind of the brief introduction we had. Um, so now, without further ado, uh, I want to pass it off to our speakers who are going to tell us more about the work that PYM does, um, its philosophies on building transnational solidarity, um, and the key takeaways from their recent solidarity delegations. So our speakers today are Rama, a community organizer with the Machdel Community Center in San Diego, and Celine, who is the national field organizer at the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, um, and both of them also are on the national board for PYM. So I will pass it off uh, to both of them. Hey. <clears throat> wow, thanks Cody for introducing us. Um, my name is Celine. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of our agenda for today. Um, so, and then I'll pass it along to Rama. So we can go to the next slide. So thanks everyone again for joining this webinar. Um, today we're gonna be talking about uh, the origins of the PYM and our philosophies on transnational organizing and transnationalism. <clears throat> Can y'all hear me okay? Um, and we'll also be talking about our transnational delegations. The first one um, being our indigenous youth delegation to Palestine that happened in November of 2018 and our Palestinian youth delegation to South Africa, which happened April, 2019. Um, and then we'll be talking about the takeaways from both of our delegations and then open, opening it up to Q&A. And um, we also have a couple of our delegates uh, present from um, some of our delegations, uh, so they can also field some questions if they want to participate at any point in time. So with that, I'll pass it off to Rama to talk about uh, the history of the Palestinian youth movement. Great, thank you. Thank you, Celine. Um, thank you, Cody, for hosting us, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, so to start us off, I'm going to speak a little bit to the history of PYM um, and kind of give some background as to where our philosophies of transnationalism come from. Um, so next slide, please. So PYM was actually uh, initially founded as the Palestinian Youth Network. And starting in 2006, Palestinian youth organizers from different formations, unions, student organizations from all over the world convened, um, once in 2006 and again in 2007. Um, and they formed the Palestinian Youth Network officially in 2008. Um, and those initial convenings from 2006 to 2007 um, laid the groundwork for the network in 2008. And so quickly on why, why this moment in history, why 2006 to 2008, what was happening in this period is that we, we were seeing the end of the second intifada or the end of the second um, Palestinian uprising, which lasted from 2000 to 2005. And so many of these youth 
um, who had been active in the Intifada in Palestine, um, in the Arab region, and even internationally, um, found that they had nowhere to really engage afterwards. Um, and this was also 10 years after the Oslo Accords, which had um, one devastated all popular forms of engagement um, out of the spheres or beyond the spheres of the political parties, beyond the spheres of the um, NGOs and the nonprofits. Um, and it also had shown that 10 years since the negotiations and the quote unquote peace process that um, Palestinians were not getting any closer to achieving any form of self-determination um, at that time. So we reached 2006 and um, as I said, there wasn't really a space for these Palestinian youth to go. And so they began convening and established and institutionalized the Palestinian Youth Network, which in 2008 represented youth from 33 different countries in many different formations um, globally. So um, from its first three years as the network between 2008 and 2011, uh, PYN organized three international summer camps um, in Syria, France, and Turkey, and each convening or summer program tackled a specific issue. So um, the first one was sorting through Palestinian identity. Uh, what does it mean to be Palestinian? What different forms of identity does that take? Um, the second one in France was focused on democratic engagement. How do we rebuild or build um, the infrastructure and the means of engaging Palestinian youth from such different contexts and geographies and political backgrounds. And the third was focused on um, more of the internal structure for the Palestinian, Palestinian Youth Network. Um, and so we get to 2011, and this is when PYN shifts to PYM. So this is when um, the organizers decide to formulate the network into a movement under a more cohesive banner. Um, at this time, we're also seeing the beginnings of the Arab uprisings across the region. So on the one hand, uh, the movement decides to really engage in local projects um, that are responding to the local context uh, of where they find themselves. But at the same time, so many of the branches and the organizers um, of PYM were also shifting, either having to leave their countries due to war, um, or because the political context um, no longer allowed for PYM to exist. Um, and so we were seeing that occurring in 2011. Um, but still between 2011 and 2015, and this is where we see more of PYM engaging with global struggles. Um, between 2011 and 2015, PYM begins strengthening its relationships with other third third world movements, as well as um, really begins to, to, to discuss and study um, the struggles of others. And so we see this with the 2012 World Social Forum in Brazil, PYM led a joint struggle delegation um, there. And again, we attended in 2013 in Tunis, um, offering different workshops um, and engaging in those discussions. Um, so from the beginning, we, you know, our, we are, we're now in the US, um, roughly since 2015, most of our activity has been in the US, but we have a really long history of engaging transnationally. Um, and so, next slide. Thanks, Cody. Um, so this is where we um, are taking a moment to kind of look back on that history and, and discuss, okay, what does that history of transnationalism mean and actually, where does it come from? So we as um, Palestinians, as a people, have been a transnational people since the Nekbe, um, since 1948, when almost half of the Palestinian population was expelled and displaced because of the establishment of the State of Israel. Um, Zionist militias committed um, crimes, um, massacres, expelled our people, and since then, we've been um, dispersed throughout the world. And so um, since, since that point, since the Nekbe, we really have become a transnational people. And as such, um, our social structures, our economic structures, our political structures have also been transnational. 
um, um, our, our organizing has responded to that condition. And so that's how we see the PLO emerge, the Palestinian Liberation Organization in the 1960s, um, is transnational in nature because of where our people are. Um, and so when we, when we witnessed Oslo in the 1990s, um, and its impacts until today, we see that a lot of the vehicles of the PLO, um, whether that be through student unions or popular committees that connected Palestinians globally, um, much of that has been lost. Um, and so we as the PYM, we see that as a main aspect of our project in reviving the national, uh, you know, our national liberation movement, um, reviving the institutions that were the vehicle for our people transnationally to wage a national liberation struggle. And so um, we see transnationalism as not just a state of our people, but also a necessary means of responding to our conditions and building and rebuilding um, our national liberation movement. Um, and so where the role of delegations come in is really in um, building that, connecting us across geographies and contexts. And then from that, um, we're able to engage in joint struggle, um, either locally or, you know, and or globally. So I'm going to hand it off to Celine now um, to talk more about delegations and start us off there. Yeah, um, thanks Rama. And if we could go to the next slide, please, I can introduce the two. So again, um, <clears throat> sorry, all my voice. Uh, so we'll be talking about two of our delegations, the November 2018 Indigenous Youth Delegation of Palestine and um, April 2019, our Transnational Palestinian Youth Organizer Delegation to South Africa. So if we could go to the next slide, I can talk about the um, yeah, say, thanks, Cody. The context um, and the concept of the Indigenous Youth Delegation, as well as some of the goals. So, um, in November of 2018, the PYM led a 10-day grassroots delegation of uh, 10 Palestinian and Indigenous youth from uh, Turtle Island to Palestine. So, it was the first delegation of Indigenous youth um, from the U.S. that were led uh, that was led by an all-Palestinian and Arab contingent. Um, the delegation visited with Palestinian youth, community members, um, and leaders in key sites of struggle throughout Palestine, including Al Quds or Jerusalem, um, Khan al Ahmar and Naqab, Al Khalil, uh, Yafa, Haifa, and ref refugee camps in the West Bank. Um, the delegation built on some of our previous work to forge and strengthen relationships with indigenous communities on Turtle Island. Um, uh, we have long recognized a natural alliance with struggle for sovereignty by indigenous nations um, due to our shared history of enduring settler colonization and we've engaged in different joint struggle efforts against settler colonialism ethnic cleansing forced displacement um, and so on you know by participating in various efforts with indigenous communities here um, so i'll give a, a little bit of an overview of different efforts that we'd engaged in prior and leading up to our delegation um, our San Diego chapter was hosting an annual border run for five years um, with Colectivo Zapatista and in 2017 co-hosted the run with the Kumeyaay and Yaqui nations. Um, in 2013, PYM members joined a delegation to Black Mesa in defense of the Diné people's sacred mountain. In 2016, we organized consecutive delegations of Palestinian and Arab community organizers to Standing Rock throughout the fall and winter months to lend support um, and solidarity to the people of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota nations in their fight against the pipeline. And in 2018, PYM members in the Bay Area organized with the local Ohlone people to defend the sacred shell mound in West Berkeley from gentrifying development efforts. Um, in addition, later in 2018, the PYM New York chapter participated in a theater residency with indigenous cultural workers and performers through American Indian House. So uh, we've witnessed, you know, we had witnessed and participated in local struggles and national campaigns that were led by indigenous youth for the rights to water, to land, to self-determination and affirmation of sovereignty. And this delegation was our turn to bring indigenous youth to our homeland. And our delegation carried an educational focus on land, um, environment, youth, and ongoing resistance to colonization while also engaging our histories through current events. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the goals as well of the delegation. So 
One of the goals was to strengthen bonds between Indigenous and Palestinian youth organizers, as well as to deepen our own analysis for engaging resistance against settler colonialism here as Palestinians living um, here in the US. Um, and as uh, internal to the PYM, we're working through the indigeneity framework as it applies to Palestine. Um, but the frameworks of indigeneity and settler colonialism are informing how we articulate our struggle as an anti-colonial one. Although, again, that's something we're also uh, thinking through it and working through. Um, so, and in addition, our, our theoretical frameworks um, and the way we understand these things can't be separated from on the ground practical applications um, with interconnected struggles. So, uh, again, the delegation's short term goal was to build with our indigenous comrades while in Palestine. Um, but also to reflect on their contexts here as well and to strengthen indigenous networks internationally. Um, and we believe that genuine solidarity can't be fortified without concrete sustained campaigns of reciprocity and hospitality, such as, you know, through uh, organizing delegations. Um, so this delegation was a really important building block in PYM's development um, in terms of building relationships and cultivating are in terms of building relationships and cultivating them with indigenous comrades, as well as in building our frameworks and praxis for joint struggle with indigenous peoples. Um, so it was you know, a turning point in concretizing what joint struggle looks like um, in our organizing as the PYM. Um, and you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just a photo of us at Standing Rock in 2016 from our delegation. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, so I can go over the program a little bit. Uh, so represented in the delegation were members from different nations, um, from the Kumeyaay, Yaki, Diné, Seneca, and Hawaii nations, as well as Palestinian youth originally from Yaffa, Lid, Jerusalem, Nablus, um, who are all currently living in exile here in the diaspora on Turtle Island. Um, we, uh, for the program itself, we wanted to visit each area of Palestine to um, help the delegates understand different aspects of what different aspects of what colonization looks like. Um, so we, uh, the delegation met with community organizations, um, advocacy organizations, uh, community leaders, and different sites of struggle. So, um, and uh, again, each of the communities that the delegation met with is facing a specific set of struggles. So uh, Palestinians in the 48 and 1948 territories have been struggling against Israelization and Zionist gentrification. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Palestinian subsistence farmers have been resisting against the wall and the theft of fertile farming land by creating alternatives for food sovereignty and reviving traditional farming methods. Um, and we can go to the next slide, please. The youth of Teishanai, the refugee camps, face the realities of refugeehood on a daily basis and have proven to be sites of resistance to occupation for over three generations. And Palestinians in Gaza who were forced out of their homes in 1948 have been rising up in mass to demand their freedom from block blockade and displacement. And we can go to the next slide, please. And in Hebron or Khalil, the delegation witnessed heavy securitization and military presence. And although we were barred from traveling to Gaza, um, the delegation recognizes that, you know, our Palestinian siblings in Gaza have been at the front lines defending our demand to return to our homelands. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And so some of the outcomes, and Adam, if you want to add, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, it helped us strengthen relationships between indigenous youth organizers and Palestinian youth organizers internationally, and help us to understand that um, we can do this work of confronting Zionism wherever we are, and that is our role. Um, and um, uh, we are also currently engaged, like the relationships that were strengthened and built throughout the delegation have also um, led to current organizing efforts. We're part of campaigns with different delegates. Uh, we're part of current organizing efforts in, in different coalitions. So there's been like some post-delegation organizing work as well that's been sustained over the past two years. Um, also as a result of these uh, these deep connections that were forged um, uh, during the delegation as well as like the shared analysis that was built. Uh, and the indigenous delegation of course helped us think through um, uh, our joint struggle analysis, which we'll talk about, elaborate more on uh, later in this presentation. Um, Rama, I don't know if you want to add anything about the program itself or about um, the takeaways from this delegation. Yeah, um, I'll just add, um, as a delegate on this delegation, um, and I know others here can attest to that, to this, um, I could, you know, the, the impression that 
um, was left on our delegates was very evident um, in the ways that they saw the actual active process of settler colonialism taking place. Um, I think in different parts of Palestine, especially in the 48 areas, or even in the Nakab in the south, um, it's very, it, it prompted a very visceral reaction um, from our delegates. And so I think coming back to the US, and I think you can also draw, you know, the comparison here in terms of, um, you know, the US continues to be a settler colonial state, but the mechanisms by which it's inflicting that look very different. Or we can say that it's at a much further stage than it is in Palestine. And so when you have indigenous youth witnessing settler colonialism today um, in the way that it's manifesting itself in Palestine, um, that left a really strong impression on our delegates. And I think that really emboldened them emboldened them to then come back home and, and take action in their different um, locales. So we'll talk more about kind of why delegations, but that's one of my reflections um, in terms of the changes I saw in our delegates after coming back. So I'll be speaking about our delegation to South Africa. Um, Cody, if you could, next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, so, in April 2019, we led our second delegation, um, our second international delegation, and this one was a delegation of transnational youth organizers from around the world to Johannesburg, South Africa. So I'll go over um, some of the context and the concept for the delegation, the planning and the program, and then some of our outcomes. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks. So um, we organized this delegation with three main objectives. So the first was to study and examine the apartheid framework. The South Africa Palestine analogy has been the guiding premise or basis for um, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement globally. And so we've seen since 2005 a growing reliance on the Palestine-South Africa comparison. Um, and so as organizers engaged in liberation work, we wanted to interrogate this more and understand what can we as Palestinians uh, learn from, for, from the South African experience for our own movement? And what are the similarities and differences between the nature of the struggles in Palestine and South Africa, the context, um, and what does apartheid really look like now, um, supposedly, um, over 25 years after um, the peace, you know, the peace processes in South Africa. Um, the second reason, or our second objective for the delegation was um, to build with transnational youth. So as I mentioned before, um, since 2015, most of our work has shifted to the US. And so with the shifts in the region, many of the connections we had built or had with other uh, branches of the PYM or other uh, youth organizers in different contexts was lost. So um, since 2017, in particular with our campaigning around Lift the Sanctions and the Great March of Return in Gaza, uh, we've been reviving a lot of those relationships and thinking a lot of, you know, thinking a lot about what are the ways we could work together. And so in planning this delegation, we decided to bring uh, 20 20 youth from different contexts. Um, they come from different community centers, from different um, research centers, from different youth formations in Palestine, in Lebanon, um, in Europe, and um, even, yeah, we had dele delegates from, from many different um, locations. Um, our third reason, for, or our third objective for um, the delegation was to build joint struggle relationships with community leaders and organizations. And so recognizing that while racial apartheid in South Africa is legally over, um, its legacy lives on in the form of economic apartheid and different forms of racial in inequalities. And so how can we today develop a joint struggle praxis in this new political context? Um, next slide, please. So more about our program. Um, actually, the planning for the delegation started in the fall of 2017. 
um, with the developing of the concept, uh, workshopping the concept paper with different partner organizations and allies, applying to grants, selecting our delegates, preparing them, applying to visas, um, preparing logistics. Um, so a lot of the work was happening over a year in advance. Um, and in the first three months leading up to the, before the delegation, we also organized uh, four webinars to prepare our delegates. We engaged in readings, we invited guest speakers, we went over the program. And so leading up to the delegation, we had time to prepare ourselves and prepare our delegates. So in terms of the program itself, it was a 10 day program, very intensive with lectures, seminars, visits to historic uh, landmark sites in South Africa, in Johannesburg specifically, um, and then meetings with many community leaders as well as anti-apartheid strugglers. So, um, you know, a day, most of our days looked like in the morning we would go to a site of struggle or a site of commemoration. Um, and Cody, if you could just look through the pictures with us. Um, so here we went to the women's jail at Constitutional Hill. Um, we also went to the Apartheid Museum. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So here we met with Henny Fally, who was very involved in South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and we also went to the Apartheid Museum as well as the Hector Peterson Museum. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, here we met with the South African Communist uh, Youth League. And so they hosted us in, in the Soweto Township where uh, Nelson Mandela and his wife Winnie um, used to live. So a lot of our um, mornings were spent visiting sites of struggle. In the afternoons, we would meet with different figures. Um, I think the next picture is with Salim Valley. No, this one is with former apartheid political prisoner Prima, who joined us for a discussion about the conditions of um, the conditions of political prisoners under apartheid. The next person we met with, of course, these are not in order, but we just wanted to give you an overview of the types of meetings we were having. Um, here we met with Salim Bali um, from the Palestine Solidarity Committee. Um, we also met with um, and this is the next slide, Cody. Um, Zane Dangor, who is the um, representative of the ANC International Relations Committee and his specialty or his focus is South African foreign policy on Israel, um, Israel-South Af South African relations. And every evening, we would uh, convene, uh, reconvene as a group and go through, um, process our different, uh, process our different uh, takeaways from each day. And we had also decided to break up the program along certain themes. So we had um, the Palestinian struggle, South African struggle, joint struggle, the peace process as four different themes. And the delegates were broken up into different groups and they were responsible for facilitating uh, the days relating to those themes and in the evenings guiding the group through the larger discussion and synthesis of the day. And so this really allowed for delegates to take more ownership over the program, to really get a handle on the material and engage it. Um, and in that way, it was a very collaborative, um, interactive uh, curriculum that we were self implementing and self facilitating. Okay, so in terms of outcomes, um, we, we saw that our transnational network really grew um, in building relationships with each of these Palestinian youth. Um, and from that point, we were really able to grow our, um, to really grow our um, capacities for transnational engagement. And so, um, we were able to host more educational webinars. Um, we were able to um, launch joint campaigns. We saw the launch of new student formations after our delegation, um, such as the Voice of Palestinian Students in 
in Palestine, that, that's connecting student organizers globally. Um, and so from this delegation, it really contributed to the revival of a lot of our relationships with um, centers and youth formations globally. A second key takeaway was um, we gained a deeper understanding around the limitations of the apartheid framework. And so, you know, textbook history will tell you this. And also what we saw on the ground was that apartheid is a limiting framework even in the South African context and we were examining different frameworks that also apply such as settler colonialism. Um, South Africa um, has a long history of, of colonization beginning in the 1600s with the Dutch and the British. Um, another dimension that we examined was one of racial, racial capitalism and so we were complicating this apartheid framework um, in the context of South Africa as well as in Palestine. And so when we look at our own context as Palestinians, we see that, yes, there is a, a regime of racial inequality that is comparable to apartheid, but we see this as one tool of a much larger settler colonial project um, that is the Zionist settler colonial project. And as well as military occupation, um, that is another tool that this, this project is using. And so as a delegation, um, one, of the consents, one of the points that we consensed on was around the ways that Zionism is really the all-encompassing uh, framework that explains what is happening in Palestine today, and especially why we have such a large number of Palestinians, over half of our population, living in exile, living outside of Palestine. And so really the ways that we understand our struggles inform, inform, our, um, inform our organizing, right? So if we are to say that apartheid is the problem, then in some ways that's prescribing or limiting the solution to integration. Um, the framework of apartheid also assumes that we as Palestinians are struggling to gain equal rights um, with our colonizers, right? And that's not a framework that we um, as Palestinians or, you know, we as PYM believe is going to um, to lead us to self-determination, lead us to the right of return in the ways that Palestinians aspire to. And so we were examining a lot of these um, limitations and complicating them and, and debating them. And Celine, um, I'll let you expand on that some more um, and talk a little bit more about the other themes that we were exploring. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for thanks for talking about that, Alma. Yeah, this was really important, you know, as Alma was saying, because um, that was one of the major questions. Like, um, you know, even though the uh, drawing these parallels between Palestine and South Africa has been really productive for activists, um, uh, we were questioning the the utility of the apartheid analogy and its limitations. And what we saw and what we witnessed and what we learned um, on the delegation helped us to understand that the importance of um, not relying on analogies or analogies between our struggles because that can flatten experiences and differences that are really important to understand. Um, we can't rely on analogy only or assumption of shared experience to, because that will also limit what kind of organizing strategies we'll take on. Um, and again, yeah, that's the, that's the thing is that we can't limit our organizing uh, to focus on ending apartheid alone. We need to think about dismantling Zionism in its entirety and what that means and what that, might, what that would look like. Um, uh, additionally, like uh, Rama pointed to this too about another one of our key takeaways around racial capitalism. Um, and th this was something uh, really important for the to understand as well as that, the, you know, in South Africa, again, as Rama was saying, there had been centuries of racialized labor and extraction of resources. There had been centuries of colonialism. Uh, that relied on settlement, on enslavement of indigenous people, um, and that that was prior to 1948. To the that was prior to the start of the apartheid system. So um, you know, focusing the anti-apartheid struggle um, didn't fully address that entire history. So um, in terms of talking about racial capitalism, a mechanism of understanding that you know both the concept of race and racial subjugation and racial regimes were simultaneously developed historically as capitalism was developed. So that those understanding that those two processes were not separate from each other, but deeply embedded within one another. 
Um, and when we sat down with um, organizers and scholars like Sinim Bali, who's part of the Palestine Solidarity Committee in South Africa, he told us that um, in South Africa, it was an incomplete revolution. Um, what the anti-apartheid struggle achieved was a negotiated settlement, but the revolution is still incomplete um, because the anti-apartheid struggle did not um, fully address the need to redistribute land and wealth. It was not one necessarily against capitalism. And that's why we see such strong economic disparity today, such clear economic disparity, um, and that we see the continuation of segregation in South Africa today. Um, so without addressing land and capital um, in South Africa, there was no possibility to fully, fully end segregation because ultimately this is also a system of racial capitalism and racial colonialism and not only apartheid. So um, apartheid is a facet of that. Um, so one of you know the most profound lessons for us um, was that we need to also think about this, about racial capitalism, and to think about how if our solutions as Palestinian organizers, as Palestinian movement builders, if our solutions don't allow for a complete redistribution of wealth, land, and power, if we don't completely overthrow colonial structures, there will be no true Palestinian liberation. Um, our liberation won't be complete, or our revolution won't be complete. Um, so how do we understand and address land and capital simultaneously and not limit our organizing to only one facet of how um, Zionism operates? Um, and, you know, the other piece around this, these takeaways was around, like, the dangers of a negotiated settlement. Um, uh, again, going back to Sinim Valley's quote around um, how this struggle was a negotiated settlement and an incomplete revolution. Um, the, although the agreements that brought about the formal end of apartheid in South Africa uh, enshrined, you know, a variety of democratic freedoms and human rights protections that were at first outlined in the Freedom Charter, um, you know, despite those acquired, newly acquired freedoms, um, uh, there was an increase in racialized securitization, privatization, post-apartheid, you know, quote-unquote post-apartheid. And basically the agreement ultimately kind of normalized British and Afrikaner settlements um, and wealth in South Africa and exacerbated the chronically poor material conditions for black South Africans. So apartheid continued in a new form. Um, so, uh, and another piece that we were thinking through a lot during the delegation was around the truth and reconciliation process, which uh, was a process to establish to produce restorative justice for victims of apartheid, um, where perpetrators were given amnesty um, as long as they told the truth of what they'd done, but where they were not held to account through any material means. So um, that, that process um, was kind of like premised on gaining the truth in the absence of justice. So, uh, and one quote, one notable quote from the Hanif who was talking to us about this process said that, you know, um, this was a question of peace versus justice and you, you couldn't have both. So the, as delegates, we were thinking about this and we were thinking about how true change can't be achieved through a negotiated settlement with a colonial force. It can only be achieved through a comprehensive process of decolonization and one that will also hold colonial violence to account. Um, so that was another important piece that we took away um, from the delegation. And I guess um, the, the one of the last piece, like the political takeaways was around um, gender justice and social liberation. Uh, we learned about, um, you know, two forms of historical gendered violence, um, one around racialized and gendered state violence that was perpetrated by the apartheid regime, and then gendered violence within the movement that which that went unaddressed. And um, it was unaddressed in the name of prioritizing political liberation before social liberation. So um, we met with one uh, feminist leader, Fatima Sharabuddin, who warned the dele us as delegates that we should consider liberation struggles comprehensively and try to address social and political liberation simultaneously, um, you know, through communal wellness, restorative justice, social healing, trauma-informed approaches as things that uh, shouldn't be in the periphery of our movements, but so something that's central to our movements. Um, so, you know, that lesson taught us that if we want to achieve, again, true liberation, even within our movements, we should implement models of accountability and justice at every level of struggle, and that we can't prioritize one facet of the struggle over another, um, because we don't want our revolution to be incomplete. Um, so again, in terms of what that means for our organizing, it was, it was a lot to think about, a lot to take away, to synthesize. We're still synthesizing and having these discussions. We have a committee in the PYM that's working on synthesizing all of these takeaways from our delegations and our joint struggle work to put it into documents that we can release in the coming months. 
um, which we will share with IOPS, of course, when um, those are complete. Uh, but in terms of what uh, these, these takeaways taught us around our organizing is that, again, our struggle isn't one that's against apartheid, it's against Zionism, and that it's our role to confront Zionism everywhere. Um, and to foreground Zion, anti-Zionism in our in our analysis. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll maybe we can go to the next slide. Actually, the next slide. I don't know, Dom, if you have anything to add before I go into this part. I thought that was good. You can go on. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, just a little bit about like what uh, our um, understandings around joint struggle and what these what these delegations taught us uh, and how they informed our understanding of joint struggle and our joint struggle practice practices is that, um, you know, one is that we want to be relying on in our joint struggle work and our in our building with other struggles, we want to rely on shared principles. Um, uh, shared visions for liberation rather than like shared experiences. We don't want to rely only on analogizing like we're, you know, the Palestinian struggle is the same thing as the South African struggle. We can't rely on that. Um, we we want to rely on shared principles. Um, the, otherwise it can flatten our differences and those differences are really key in helping us understand like really what we're up against um, and how we want to organize. Um, and of course, this doesn't mean that we aren't combating the same systems of oppression or intersecting systems of oppression, um, but just keeping in mind the limitations of, of relying on analogy. Um, additionally, like again, in terms of uh, how foregrounding anti-Zionism in our analysis, this is PYM's analysis around combating and confronting Zionism wherever we are, um, and how thinking about how Zionism doesn't only affect Palestinians, um, and this also helps us connect um, our uh, you know, our local work to the transnational work. Um, uh, confronting Zionism on a local scale is still a confrontation of Zionism. And, and then uh, we have to, again, Rama mentioned before, we have three funds, the transnational joint struggle and communal. And in terms of our communal work and our communal building, as PYM, we're, we're, we're growing as a movement. Um, we're working on, with our communities on, local, on a local level. So we're not trying to only house this analysis uh, with us as organizers, or, or, um, or kind of you know we're not we're not an organization that's just going to like sign on to something and be like all right here we are practicing solidarity. But we want to do we're doing the long long term work of really like working and talking and having these conversations with our communities, um, bringing them along along with us, um, uh, you know, so that we're not. Um, just con confining our analysis and all of our political takeaways and all of this stuff around joint struggle just within us um, are, are like a handful of organizers, if that makes sense. Like how do we, how do we really bring our communities along um, in, in learning um, and understanding the takeaways from our delegations, from our organizing work, um, and how do we really build uh, in the long term on the communal front and integrate like cross community building and cross movement building on a local scale as well as on a transnational scale. So um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, and I'll pass it along to Rama to see if she has anything to add to that. And then maybe we can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so our last two points, we wanted to, to kind of summarize um, and also elaborate on why delegations and the importance of delegations um, in our movement work. And then I'll also conclude with just some reflections on the actual organizing and program, like programmatic pieces that um, we've been thinking through recently. So um, as ILPS is planning um, their delegation to Palestine, we thought this might be helpful. So um, why delegations? Um, next slide, please. So we see the ways that delegations and these exchanges have been really at the heart of, of movement building across struggles. So historically, um, delegations were a key part of building linkages and relationships between third, third world and national liberation struggles in terms of garnering political support um, as well as material support. So, you know, a popular delegation that is often referenced is uh, the Black Panthers meeting with the PLO delegation 
at the first Pan-African Cultural Festival in Algiers in 1969. So this is one example of the many delegations that the Palestinian Liberation Organization was organizing as a way to build with and connect with struggles globally. Today, we've been seeing a few delegations that are building on that legacy. Um, the Dream Defenders delegation to Palestine is one example. I believe that was in 2016, um, following the Ferguson Gaza moment that we saw um, in 2014. Um, Black for Palestine is another organization that's been building with Palestinians in Lebanon and they led a delegation in 2017. Um, so we're seeing contemporary iterations of this historic practice um, of delegations and exchanges. And so really what delegations help us do is um, they help us connect people. Um, very simply put, they help us connect with others across movements and geographies. Um, they help us build relationships, which are in many ways the foundations of our movement work, knowing people, knowing um, what people are involved in, understanding more about how we can connect, how we can build together. Um, second point is delegations also, um, I think when you travel to another person's center of struggle, you, um, it, it motivates you to action. Um, it helps you comprehend the realities on the ground um, so that when you go back to your local context, you're able to um, really be in solidarity um, with with those people, and I saw that a lot as I spoke on as I spoke to earlier with our indigenous youth delegates um, when we returned from Palestine, and the imp impression that it left on them. Um, I think when we talk about transnational solidarity and joint struggle, um, I think it's really our networks globally that help us move information, help us exchange political information, um, deepen our political understandings and inform our praxis in the day to day. Um, so that's another thing that we really took away from our delegation to South Africa in reviving a lot of the relationships we had with Palestinian youth globally. Um, and then as Celine touched on and, and which was a major theme um, for our South Africa delegation was really exploring the differences and the nuances in our context. I think um, that's really important in developing really clear praxis and really clear politics around our work. Um, and lastly, uh, next slide please, I'll talk just a little bit about the actual organizing of it um, and some of our, our takeaways there. So, um, you know, both of our delegations were very intensive. They were each about 10 days long and they required us to do a lot of um, travel daily. Um, and I think if I was to reimagine um, one of our delegations, and this is something for, I think, ILPS to consider is to partner with another local organization or maybe your counterpart locally and to identify a project or two that you can work with, um, work on together. I think that allows for more local immersion um, in the way that our, dele our, dele like our delegation didn't as much because we were um, hopping from one context to the other. So I think um, identifying like who is, that, who is that partner, what are some projects we can work with, uh, work on while we're there would be really, um, really good to do. Um, we found that our webinars leading up to the delegation, uh, both delegations were really helpful in connecting with the delegates before we reached Palestine or before we went to South Africa and really grounding everyone in the experience that was coming up. Um, in terms of media and documentation, um, having some strategy around how you plan to report on the delegation or capture the delegation. Um, for the South Africa delegation, we were posting to social media daily. For the native delegation, we had a blog uh, that we would update daily with um, reflections and synth synthesis from different delegates. Um, and that was a way to really engage everyone on the delegation. And then lastly, um, with any travel to Palestine, it's important to recognize that there are millions of Palestinians who are displaced and exiled from their homeland. And so visiting any colonized or occupied place, I think, 
and I strongly believe that it it warrants immense responsibility um, on folks to take back those lessons and and plug into action or plug into campaigns or organizations um, that are actively struggling and actively carrying this work. Um, and I think that's the best way you can pay forward um, your experience in Palestine and the delegation there. Um, so with that, we will open it up for discussion or Q&A, um, or if we wanted to maybe plug our upcoming events um, and provide some links, we can also discuss those. Um, yeah, so here, um, if you could go back one, Cody. Thanks. So um, here we linked um, the South Africa um, synthesis piece that we wrote. Um, it's titled, What Can South Africa Teach Us Palestinians? Um, so that's a good reference for a lot of the synth synthesis that we shared today. And then the blog for the indigenous delegation can be found at pymusa.com backslash Turtle Island to Palestine. And then we also included our social media handles so you could follow us and um, stay up to date with our current campaigns and projects. And, um, and then, Celine, if you want to speak to our upcoming webinar. Yeah, um, so we're hosting, yeah, so we're hosting a webinar on um, May 16th, Saturday, um, 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, to, as, for a, um, a community commemoration of the Nakba, and we want to really talk about and center the right of return, um, thinking about uh, how we can center the right of return, a right of return in our organizing work and in our advocacy work. Um, talk about the ongoing struggle of Palestinian uh, uh, refugees and the ongoing struggle in Palestinian refugee camps, and what is our role as um, as youth in in the diaspora who are in exile? Um, how do we assume a role in our in our struggle um, against Zionism and in our, a role in our struggle for the right of return? Um, we'll ha be having a couple speakers, um, Dr. Salman Abu Sitti from the Palestine Land Society, who's written a lot of really important texts around mapping. Uh, literally map and return, how that can practically look. Um, Nadia Yunus from al Nakob Center, um, one of our partners, will be talking about the conditions uh, on the ground in Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. Um, we will have Suzanne Abu Dhawa, who's a Palestinian writer and author, who will be talking about her literary work and be reading an excerpt for us from one of her texts. And um, Lina Abu Jarade, who, who is uh, one of the winners of our Ghassan Kenafani Resistance Arts Scholarship, who will be performing a piece. Um, and, uh, you know, during the, during this webinar, we'll be talking about different ways, um, different calls to action and ways to plug in and organize um, in a way that centers the right of return um, in our work. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, too. I think you covered it all. Um, we can link the registration in the, um, in the chat. Yeah, and if there's going to be a follow-up email sent, we can also link some of the uh, some of those links that Adama put up in the slide um, from our delegates, from our delegations, and also um, some articles that were written about the delegations too that are really helpful in breaking down um, the political takeaways and how um, we have like you know we built a renewed commitment um, as you know our as our in our delegations and with our delegates to revitalize like two-way forms of solidarity and joint struggle. Um, across indigenous communities globally and also with um, South Africans and other people struggling against oppression globally. So we can link those two um, for follow-up email as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you both so much, Rama and Celine. Uh, this really is an incredible gift y'all have given us um, in sharing your experiences in building this transnational solidarity. Um, I think really solidarity between our movements is one of the sharpest weapons we have when it comes to combating imperialism. So I'm so thankful uh, on behalf of IOPS that y'all um, share these experiences and pass on your lessons for us to take part with you as well. Uh, we are moving into the Q&A session. Um, thank you um, for uh, noting the follow-up. Uh, we will send a follow-up email and make sure that all of these links um, and resources that uh, were mentioned are in there. Um, now in the Q&A session, uh, there were some questions uh, that came up. Um, you know, there was 
some questions about um, sort of next steps and upcoming actions. Um, I know that we, uh, y'all just shared about the NECBA webinar coming up. Um, there will also be some um, other uh, ILPS calls to action after this. Um, but I'm wondering, since these questions also really ask about what are the best way to support the work and campaigns of PYM, even if we don't have a local chapter in our city? Um, and also, what are some of the campaigns that people and organizations around the world can participate in? So I don't know if one of you wants to take one of those. Um, Rama, do you want to talk about the Lebanon fundraiser and I can talk about like mutual aid stuff and Sure. Um, so, yeah, thanks for your question. There are so many ways that you could plug in um, with grassroots, you know, movement work. My initial thought was donate. <laughs> But I mean, if you're looking to get into more of the tangible work, um, Celine will speak to the different um, COVID-19 relief um, work and mutual aid programs that we've set up in different, different cities. Um, but one that we've um, set up to support our people in Lebanon in the refugee camps, uh, we set up a fundraiser to send food packages um, to a few refugee camps in Lebanon. And um, yes, materially, this is humanitarian work. It's relief work. Um, we know that our people in the camps have been dealing with um, economic deprivation for decades. And so we recognize that COVID-19 is not just, it, while it presents so many risks, it's really compounding decades of lack of infrastructure and resources um, for our people in the camps. And so we see our work in fundraising for um, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon as part of our political work of supporting and endorsing the, the steadfastness of our people. And so a great way you could support us in that is by donating um, and or sharing the fundraiser. Yeah, and I can add, um, similarly we have we've set up so we set up some mutual aid um, uh, networks and uh, responses throughout our local chapters. Um, we have 10 local chapters so far. Um, and that's also, you know, in terms of our like communal work, we see that also as political work, um, building relationships with local Arab institutions and organizations, um, responding directly to the needs of our communities here, the needs of Palestinian and Arab communities here, um, here in the US locally. Um, so uh, we, we've built out those um, networks uh, in a couple different cities and we can share the link to that for folks to check out what kind of resources we've, what we've, what we've created, um, who we're building with. Um, additionally, in terms of campaigns and maybe other things that folks can support, um, we are hosting, we, we have a student empowerment committee that's, um, that's been doing a lot of work in supporting student organizing, um, uh, supporting student organizers and thinking about how to transition into community organizing um, and also providing different resources and materials for political education and, and, and campus organizing and community organizing work for students. We have a, we currently ha are running a political education series in partnership with the National Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, and we post that on our social media. We try to have a webinar every two weeks. Um, uh, so political education series leading up to thinking about how we want to organize and mobilize together. So um, I think just sharing that, um, maybe participating, joining those, they're, they're really great. Um, I think that would be really helpful as well. Um, and another one of our um, political campaigns that is directly confronting Zionism has been around our anti-surveillance work. Um, PYM has also been really looking at the relationships between Zionism and surveillance and um, you know, Zionism surveillance, the war on terror, anti-Muslim uh, policies and programs um, that are being built out here. Um, you can also follow that on our social media. We're currently part of um, a campaign um, in partnership with organizations like the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, um, Muslim Justice League, to combat the expansion of surveillance programs that are directly targeting the communities that we work with, that are directly targeting refugees. Um, Muslim, Arab, Palestinian communities, black communities in the US. Um, and also one way I saw a question around like how we take our, 
how we talk to local communities who might not know much about the Palestinian struggle. I think one way we're doing that is also talking about how Zionism is manifesting locally, how it affects other communities locally, um, and kind of just mapping that out um, is a, has been a good way to introduce the Palestinian struggle and what we're um, and, and what anti-Zionism is um, and how we organize against it. So those are a couple of our campaigns. We usually list them on our social media. So if you follow us on our social media, you'll see the different kind of work um, that we're doing. Our local chapters are taking up different types of work. Um, but those are some of the major ones that I can think of right now. And we can also send out in a follow-up email like some, more, um, some links to specifically where you can find out more about each uh, campaign or project. Thank you both so much for offering all those ways that we can plug in and support. Um, there was another question from earlier. How does PYM take the experiences and learnings from the delegations and introduce them to local communities that have no exposure to the Palestinian struggle? Celine, do you want to? Do you want to start us off? Uh, I, I think that was one of those ways was in terms of like the way that the delegations informed our joint struggle um, practice and how we engage in joint struggle work and connecting the local to the transnational. It, one way is just that piece I raised earlier around, um, around talking about how uh, Zionism is affecting our communities here locally, how it manifests here in the US as well. Um, that was one of the key takeaways of both delegations is that we need to foreground Zionism or anti-Zionism in our analysis and that our struggle is an anti-Zionist one. And how can we build, um, uh, how can we build with other communities? How can we do cross movement work and cross community organizing? Um, not, not only in targeting white supremacy and anti-black systemic racism, but also, uh, also centering and bringing in um, anti-Zionism into these larger, into fights in the US around against policing, against surveillance, against prisons. Um, those are some ways that we're um, trying to bring in that and introduce um, uh, the struggle against Zionism and the Palestinian struggle for liberation to local communities in our local contexts. Um, that's one way. Uh, I don't know, Ramo, if you have anything to add to. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our work locally also takes place through different coalitions um, and other campaign work. Um, and depending on the chapter, it looks differently. But um, in the Bay Area, um, where I was previously organizing, we were part of the Palestine Action Network, or PAN. And so that was a coalition that consisted of um, a lot of solidarity organizations um, and other local, or, like local community uh, organizations as well. Um, and I think as much as we can, organizing a lot of programming and events um, that brought in other struggles as well. Um, but I think luckily now, um, especially in the last five years or so, um, we've seen that Palestine is increasingly becoming part of a progressive agenda. So it's rare that we don't, you know, it's rare to find local communities that haven't heard of Palestine or the struggle um, because we've made such inroads in different movements, whether that be the immigrant justice movement or indigenous, you know, indigenous movements, um, other movements for racial and economic justice. Um, and so I think a lot of that work is being done through our campaigns and coalitions and reading the larger political landscape. Um, I think we're finding that more and more people are understanding what's happening are able to connect Palestine to their local context. Um, and that in general, we find that discourse and public opinion is really shifting. All right. Um, if anyone has any other questions, um, please post them in our chat. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting close to the end. So we still have some more time. Um, in the meantime, there was a question that I wanted to pose. Um, so an ILPS US um, is part of the uh, coalition to march on the Democratic National Convention this year, um, which is very much up in the air what a lot will look like with the COVID pandemic and quarantine. Um, but the 
the need to respond and actually have a people's response is still very much there. So I um, was one part of part of what we're of what we've been talking about in ILPS is the creation of a people's platform to combat sort of the the democrat like the the usual democratic or republican party platforms that just speak for the ruling class and not the people. So I'm wondering uh, a question to pose is how do y'all see what is y'all's experiences in you know bringing up questions of solidarity building and grassroots movement building um, in spaces where maybe the talk about like a grassroots movement from the ground up um, hasn't been happening as much? How do you build with relationships and alliances with groups um, and start that conversation about what it means to build grassroots people power as the solution to the problems we see? This is a really good question. I feel like one that, you know, I grapple with a lot and I'm sure it all with this too, in terms of talking about, you know, even in, even in the organizing work against the DNC that involves a lot of, you know, like nonprofits, maybe major nonprofits too, like in general, like how do you bring in this question or the focus around grassroots building? Yeah. I think thinking about how, like, I think it's maybe talking about it as like who we want, who should our reference point be in our, in our work, if we're gonna build a people's platform. Um, we want our reference point not to be, not to be, an, you know, a single organization or, or like a handful of individuals that might come from a certain community, but we want the reference point to be like a grassroots base or like a movement base um, uh, of, of community that's like actively thinking about these questions and are also that's thinking and about um, ways that these that different systems are impacting us um, on, a, on a local scale. So I think it's I think it's just about trying to frame it as like we need to be centering grassroots um, movement building and we need to be talking about that and as, as a reference point and we need to see grassroots organizations and grassroots movements as a reference point for our organizing work. Um, I think otherwise it, the messaging and the framing of things becomes unclear or or doesn't encompass like the totality of what you know one what our conditions are and what um, what it is that we're up against and how do we actually dismantle these things in the long term. Um, so I yeah for me it's been you know my fr my frustrations or I guess my experiences with this has just been around like who who do we really see as our reference points and. Um, why is it important to to center grassroots organizing and grassroots mobilizing as as like a core reference point um, in, our, in whatever it is that we're building or whatever our work is? Um, and I think sometimes it can be, you know, folks can lose sight of that and when in thinking about like the long term, like our vision for our movements, when we get caught up in um, just like where we work or, you know, the the name of like an organization and having that be present, I think it's just trying to think about really long term, like what is the role of our organizations? What are the role of our, what's the role of our movements? Who are we situating as the reference point? Um, and yeah, trying to have that conversation, which I feel is a bit difficult. I hope that makes sense, Cody, but that's just where I'm going with this in my head. I don't know Ram, if you have anything to add to. Yeah, I mean, essentially what I hear you asking is like, how do we build people power? Um, I think it's about how do we build enough power ourselves that, and for our movements that higher power concedes. Um, and that's something that we are always grappling with. Um, how do we build local power? And oftentimes we think about that in the communal sense. So we previously spoke about like transnational joint struggle and, and communal as our three, as our three fronts. And, um, you know, on the communal front, we think about rebuilding our institutions so that we can ourselves service our people and um, for there to be a space as an alternative to where the state isn't able to provide. And, and I think the COVID support is a really good example of people building power in that sense um, and developing the mechanisms and infrastructure where the state isn't able to support. Um, on the joint struggle front, I think 
as we previously touched on earlier, it's, it's a lot about building coalition um, and building across, across movements. Um, and I think one really good example that we've recently plugged into, a coalition that we've recently plugged into is Racial Justice Has No Borders. Um, it's a new anti-war coalition that um, just, I think, end of last month, hosted a town hall um, as an alternative to the um, one of the democratic uh, convention events. Um, and so we, um, yeah, I think examples before us and examples that we're engaged in today really speak to that question. And I think they offer a model for how we can answer that question. Um, so yeah, it's called the racial, racial justice has no borders. And um, we're working there with a lot of anti-war organizations that are really targeting the upcoming uh, elections and presidential candidates. Yeah, and I just want to add one thing to, Rama brought up a really important point about even like what our mutual aid work is doing and um, this, this idea of like, we want to be the ones also offering services and how does that make way for also empowering and building politically with our communities. Also in terms of like how we think about um, building on a communal level, not only offering services where the state does not, but also how can we build up that power to block block when, for example, liberal Zionism wants to enter our spaces or block um, harmful policies or harmful programs that are, are entering our spaces. So thinking about that as well, or entering our communities. Um, so yeah, those, those are some ways to think about it, I guess. Thank you. Uh, as you both demonstrated and as our folks in the chat were just saying, this is a very uh, difficult conversation to start sometimes. Um, but of course, it's one of the most crucial conversations so that, you know, liberal Zionism or soft Zionism or any kind of, you know, um, sort of, quote unquote, soft justification for the, you know, regular ruling class parties to continue to dictate things um, keeps coming up. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for those responses. Uh, we are getting to the end of our time. Uh, there aren't any other questions I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, so I just wanted to thank both of you, Rama and Celine, so much again um, for coming on here and for telling us all of the lessons and takeaways from your delegations and really reminding us the power, like the sheer material power that comes from our organizing when we build uh, solidarity across boundaries, across um, national boundaries, across gender boundaries, class boundaries. Um, because of course these are all boundaries that were set by imperialism. So thank you for um, showing us the concrete tools we can all take in strengthening those. Um, as we finish, there are a few calls to action that I wanted to highlight here. Um, so one of them of course is for the Nakba commemoration uh, webinar that was just shared. Um, the link is gonna be in the chat the link was in the chat and we'll make sure that it's in the follow-up email. Um, the other one that I mentioned um, was that ILPS um, is putting together a, a side project, uh, a side event at the coalition, uh, with the coalition to march on the DNC. Um, again, about building up a people's platform uh, as an alternative to um, the democratic platform and how, you know, we expectantly, it will just be put in place to put a progressive face on imperialist policies. Um, so look more, uh, look for more information on that as the coalition's plans um, solidify in the weeks to come. Um, and then also finally, uh, ILPS US is working alongside ILPS Canada um, to put on, at least on the US side, our first delegation to Palestine. Um, and so we're very excited um, to um, be partnering with a different number of organizations on putting this together. Um, and I'm gonna pass it off to Katie um, with ILPS and the International Women's Alliance um, to talk more about this. Hi everyone, uh, sorry for any background noise. I'm right next to a busy road. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of highlight a couple things. Uh, after such a great presentation from Rama and Celine on behalf of uh, PYM, I think there's just a lot of clarity around 
uh, why delegations are important, uh, all the way from like why it's important to go to Palestine, right, to the importance of activists here uh, at the grassroots level, getting the opportunity to go there. I think those were all reasons we really considered whatever deciding to take a delegation there. Um, but what I think is really unique about the delegation that we'll be taking is that it's uh, organized by ILPS here in the US and in Canada. We're working specifically with ILPS Canada member organization Sami Dune, um, which does a lot of work around Palestinian political prisoners uh, and the movement to free them. Uh, and so getting to work with that through the framework that ILPS has of uh, anti-imperialism and internationalism really reminds me of the importance of um, we're not just it reminds us that we're not just organizing for our individual communities, but we're actually organizing for global liberation from capitalism and imperialism uh, and colonialism and all of those byproducts of imperialist nations like the US and Canada. And so it's really an opportunity to go and strengthen and learn from activists on the ground in Palestine, um, as well as coming back and bringing those lessons and really strengthening our movements here so we can continue to work together. Um, to create a better world uh, for all of us, right? Which includes and has to include a free Palestine. Um, we also want to acknowledge it's, uh, it's a big trip, right? And uh, a lot of us who are excited to go have the privilege to go. And so we do want to come back and really share that experience with folks. Um, and if you are someone who wants to help figure out logistics or help us plan the trip, uh, but you're not able to go, we definitely love that as well. Um, yeah, just really anything you can offer if you have friends or contacts who would be interested in coming, that would be great too. We have a form that you can fill out with just some general questions about um, what you're interested in doing on a delegation like that. Since we don't have a firm date currently, we were hoping to go at the end of this year, but it's not looking possible due to the current conditions. So um, there's still a lot of flexibility in the trip in terms of uh, what communities we're visiting, uh, kind of what uh, sectors we're really focusing on while we're there. So yeah, open to any help or anyone who's interested as well. Um, and Cody, I'm wondering if you could drop the link to the form in the chat um, so folks could fill that out if they're interested. Uh, I actually don't have the, the link okay. ready at my fingertips, but we will make sure that that um, link comes out in the follow-up email. Thank um, you. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and I think that your point that you made that was also echoed by both Rama and Celine is that it really is uh, a privilege to be able to go on delegations like this, especially when it's a solidarity delegation from um, from the US or Canada, like what I like to call the Zionist Central Bank. <laughs> um, and so it really um, comes down to an internationalist duty that um, we see as ILPS to physically travel to the centers of people's liberation struggles, learn their lessons, and when we come back to wherever we, uh, we are based, um, to drive their fight home as if it's our fight, because that's, in ILPS, we really believe that when we fight together, we win together. Um, so we really do hope that um, you will join us on this delegation um, and take up the, the duty um, to uh, build our, continue to build this transnational solidarity and to widen our movements so we can narrow the target, which is imperialism and all of its um, byproducts of Zionism, settler colonialism and everything else. Um, so with that, um, that brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, thank you everyone again for logging in. Uh, Celine or Rama, do you have any um, closing remarks you'd like to give? Um, I guess just that, you know, we're, we, I, we can definitely help with the follow-up and sending out these links and that we're currently working on also synthesizing a lot of these takeaways um, and analysis as well. So we can also share that and continue to share that in the future um, in the coming several months. Um, but just appreciate everyone for joining the webinar. Appreciate the comments and the questions. Um, I was just looking through them again and they were really, they're really good. Um, and thanks for taking these hours out of your Saturdays to join us in this discussion. So I appreciate everyone here. Yeah, and just to add, um, we, we're happy to have more conversations as you all are planning your delegation. Um, having gone to Palestine, um, we'd be happy to like strategize more about what the delegation could look like. Um, 
so opening that door and yeah besides that thank you all so much for joining us um and we really appreciate the opportunity to share and we actually hadn't um done a lot of reporting back on our delegation so this was really i think generative for us to really reflect and and hopefully we'll do a few more in the future so thank you excellent well we look forward to the continued unity and the continued struggle ahead so on behalf of ILPS United States, thank you again, everyone, so much for logging on today. Um, again, this webinar has been recorded, so we'll follow up as soon as we can once that recording is uploaded. Um, and either at that time or even before then, we'll um, follow up with all of the links that have been mentioned here and any kind of follow-up that people can plug into. Um, but with that, um, please continue to stay safe during this time of pandemic. Um, but don't stop organizing. Let's build up our strength so when we can hit the streets again, we'll be hitting them 10 times as stronger as we were before. So enjoy the rest of your Saturday and we'll see you in the fight.